Hear now the scripture for you today, one from the book of Genesis and one from the book of Revelation. From Genesis chapter 2 verses 4 through 9. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. On the day the Lord God made earth and sky before any wild plants appeared on the earth, before any field crops grew, because the Lord hadn't yet sent rain on earth and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land. Though a stream rose from the earth and watered all the fertile land, the Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into his nostrils. The human came to life. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and put there the human he had formed. In the fertile land, the Lord God grew every beautiful tree with edible fruit, and also he grew the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And from Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. Then the angel showed me the river of life-giving water, shining like crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the city's main street. On each side of the river is the tree of life, which produces twelve crops of fruit, bearing its fruit each month. The tree's leaves are for the healing of the nations. May God bless the reading and the hearing and the understanding of the scripture. Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the openness of all of our hearts be formed in your love and grace. May you teach us and challenge us and encourage us to live as your people. Amen. So I'm living in a season of life where every day I get to see just how different my kids' personalities are becoming. They are both each 50% of the same two parents. They have grown up in the same houses and mostly around the same people, but somehow, some way, they are just so different. And nowhere have I seen this clearer than as we keep getting teased by little bits of cool weather. We've been using the fire pit on our back patio. And if you want to know more about a person, no matter how old they are, if you want to know more about a person, who they are and what's on their mind, sit around a fire with them. I don't know what it is, but there is something about sitting around a fire that helps people to open up, to say what is on their mind, that maybe gives a little more to a conversation than would normally happen in other places. So as we have been around the fire... Ellis, my son, he is the perfect mix of a helpful oldest child and a budding pyromaniac. Can I put this in the fire? What can I put in the fire? Please let me put something in the fire. I'll be right back. I'm going to go look for sticks to put in the fire. I'll be right back. And he runs into the house and I'm kind of wondering like, what precious thing is he going to try and throw in the fire? And he comes back with like a cardboard box. that's like bigger than the fire pit itself. Um, and he's got that glint in his eyes. Like you're going to let me put this in the, in the fire, right? Thank you, son. You are so selfless in your help. Uh, <laughs> contrast that with, um, my daughter is completely different. See, while I'm, while I'm with Ellis, I'm trying to keep him out of the fire as best I can. And I'm trying to teach him fire safety, which feels a little bit like I'm trying to teach a fish how to climb a tree. But Maggie, my uh, daughter, our freshly minted two-year-old, um, is different. For a while the other night, we would sit there and all she would do was stare into the fire. She, she couldn't look away. She was just staring into the fire. And me, being a proud dad with a little bit of bias, was like, look at her. She's not going around trying to burn everything we own. She's thoughtful. She's the wisest two-year-old I know. I've, got a, I'm, I've been graced with this uh, Buddha baby contemplating the depths and the meaning of existence. Until she turns to me and she throws her arm towards the fire. We weren't that close. It's okay. She puts her arm towards the fire and says, hand which if you don't speak toddler, I'll translate for you. She's asking, I can put my hand in the fire? Now is the right time for me to put the hand in the fire? And I would say, no, no, don't do that. It'll hurt. You'll cry. 
So she thinks about it for a second. Instead of hand, the second one, she goes, foot? No, don't put your foot in. It'll hurt. You will cry. Do not put your tongue in the fire. Do not get your tongue anywhere near the fire. And at this point, she's figured it out. She's starting to smirk. It's a game for her, right? Whereas Ellis wants to just feed the fire all night long. She's trying to be like, I, I can stick my hand in the fire. I can stick my foot in the fire. And it just went on and on and on. And she tried every different way of saying it to the point where she goes, me, Maggie, do it. I do it. Hand. All the while, she is just cracking herself up at her own weird humor. And all I'm going to say is, I have no idea where she gets that from. I have known for a long, long time that there's more to me being a dad to these two kids than what just has to get done each day. There's more to my lifelong calling as a dad than to say, no, you have to put on clothes. No, get in the car. We have somewhere to be. No, eat these chicken nuggets. No, go take a bath. No, get in bed. Like those are the, that's the baseline. They're important. But what I'm more and more aware of every single day is that there's trickier questions. Like how do I help nurture and grow two kids that have very different personalities? That based on as they get older and as they face different things and as they figure out who they are, they're going to need different things from me in different seasons. And how do I give them what they need so that they can flourish and thrive? Even though I know that as they grow, they're going to think differently and go through different experiences and see the world differently. What can I do as a dad so that my kids don't just end up as one more thing to get done on my to-do list because there's just more to it than that and the thing is I think that's something that we all struggle with in different seasons in different times of life we are all if we're not careful really prone to take parts of our life from which we draw so much joy and so much meaning and if we are not careful those things can land right on the same list as pick up groceries to meet this deadline take care of this thing get it done, fall asleep, get up and do it again the next day. Like I've said, we're in a series called The Hope-Filled Journey, and just about every single Sunday at Parkway, the last words we say together are our mission statement, that we at Parkway feel that we are called to demonstrate God's grace and inspire a hope-filled journey with Jesus. We believe that is the sole mission God has called us to. But what does it really mean to be on a hope-filled journey? To be somewhere, but to know that you're called to work towards somewhere else. That you've been somewhere in the past, but that's not necessarily where you're going in the future. We've tried to, we're talking honestly about what does it mean to be hopeful? And that hopeful doesn't just mean naive, and hopeful doesn't just mean, oh, everything's fine, even when things aren't fine. Whew, that is some rain. We are asking in this season, what is the next step on Parkway's hope-filled journey? Where are we going together? Now, a minute ago, I read two scriptures, one from Genesis and one from Revelation, one from the beginning of the Bible, one from the end of the Bible. They are very different scenes written by different people in different times and different places and situations, but they are both connected by a detail. That these scenes in different places and times, they're connected by a God who at the beginning of this story and at the end of this story, God is building some big new hopeful thing, some new dream of what can be around a tree. In Genesis, the garden God has planted in a place called Eden. This is actually the second separate uh, creation story in Genesis. In the first one, some of y'all may have heard that before, the world is this kind of dark, formless, and void place. The Spirit of God moves over the face of the waters. This is the story where God looks at what can be and says, let there be light, let there be land that comes up out of the sea, let there be this and that and everything. And on the seventh day, there is rest. But in Genesis 2, we seem to land at the beginning of a different sort of story. This is not the big, dark, formless void where God moves over the face of the water. This is a story where there is already ground, but there has not been any rain. There are no plants because there are no people to grow the plants. 
If the first story is dark and chaotic water to be tamed, the second is of a God who shows up on hard, cracked ground that has never seen rain, never seen growth, never seen life. And that God gathers together the dust of the earth, shapes it and breathes into it the breath of life to create a person. And this person who came from dust and will one day return to it is placed in a garden that God had planted. If you read on a few verses later, you can read that the person's job is to tend and to care for, to grow and nurture God's garden. All this garden, this story, the hope for what this person will be is built around two mysterious trees called the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Neither are exactly explained to us what they are. Now, if that story of creation feels incredibly ancient to you, it is, and you're right. And if your modern brain is sort of rebelling against the ancientness of those words, remember, when these words were written down, they were not written to replace your life sciences textbook. It was written to teach you something about who God is and what God is like and the world that God wants to make and who you are in it. If you skip to the end in Revelation, the vision where we drop in is literally in the last chapter in the last book of the Bible. It comes after God has won this final battle of good versus evil. God combines heaven and earth into one new thing. All things are made new in God. A new heaven and a new earth and a new city in which people and God live together. And seemingly at the heart of this new city is this river of life flowing from the throne of God and waters this tree of life. Is it the same one as before? Is it something different? There's no real clear answers here. But this tree in the vision at the end of the end is a tree of life which grows fruit all months of the year and its leaves are described as here for the healing of the world. At the beginning of Scripture and the end of Scripture, God builds out some new hope, not by shouting it down the mountain for people to build and to do, not threatening or shaming or guilting, but the hope that is built around these trees in the beginning and the end is by a God who is willing to till and plant and work the ground, of shaping and forming, nurturing some new possibility that didn't seem possible before taking the reality of now and creating some new thing. In their own ways, the story in Genesis and the story of Revelation both have been read to try and make sense of life in the world today. But ultimately, as far back as we look, there was a tree, and as we look far ahead, there is a tree. But we are people that are called to live a certain sort of way between those two trees. We are people who can often feel stuck living life in the in-between. Now, as we ask those questions, how to live, when we read these verses, let me just throw out a good guiding rule of Scripture. And this will be good if you take nothing else away. If you're someone who has ever opened the Bible and read something and thought, I have no idea what that means. I'm just going to give up. Here's a good sort of rule to keep in your back pocket. You can often get the most out of Scripture if you ask, what does this Scripture or what does this author want to tell me about God? Sometimes we get tripped up on a different question. Who here has ever been to a Bible study or Sunday school and something is read and you have no idea what it means and then the first question out of the teacher's mouth is, what do you think that means? You got to say something. You can't just say, I have no idea because you might as well be saying, well, I'm a bad Christian and I have no idea what this means. But here's the thing. Whether you're talking scripture or any other kind of literature, what does it mean is the wrong question because Held in those words is not one single meaning that if you dig deep enough, you can find the one meaning. Scripture is something we do the work of our whole life long to interpret and make sense of. Let me tell you why that matters for these verses. There are a lot of writers who have looked back at Genesis and said something about it more or less that this is God's original plan. This is, I have never had to compete with rain this hard. Man. There have been a lot of writers who have looked back at Genesis and said something to the effect. Thank you. 
They have looked at Genesis and called it something like God's original plan, God's blueprint, the way that God wanted things to be. And I can get how they landed there. But if that's true, that has really big implications for applying Scripture to life today. Because if that's the original plan, the blueprint, how it was always supposed to be, then the measure of how well we're doing this is in how well we're going back. How well we are trying to recreate ancient culture. When throughout Scripture, we can see again and again, God is one who rarely says, go back to the way things used to be. God is often one who takes the reality and things as that is, and instead calls people to take what they have and through the power and grace of God, create some new possibility for the future. It's hard to say that we follow a God who says, go back. That's why it matters to ask, not what, not what does this mean, but who is God? By the same token, there have been a lot of pastors who have looked at Revelation and preached something to the effect of, it doesn't really matter how bad things get or what happens, because God has already won the battle. It's already decided. Death and evil and pain have already lost. I'm sure some of y'all have heard sermons like that before. And if that's true, then there's really little for us to do in a life of faith and simply wait it out. All while there are plenty of people who live life around us, live next door to us, go to church with us, who in different seasons of life, their life has been turned upside down by the reality of death and evil and pain. But throughout Scripture, again and again, God is often portrayed as one who doesn't just treat pain and grief as a temporary thing that doesn't matter. God doesn't treat death and evil and pain as an on-paper problem. God often meets people who are hurting and grieving and fear for the future. He meets them where they are. And promises that these things that seem impossible or that will be the end, these are things that can be overcome. That in Jesus Christ, in his life, death, and resurrection, the worst thing is never the last thing. That when we ask, who is God in this? God is one who does not guarantee us final victory, therefore just sit back, relax, have a drink, it's going to be great. But calls us on to something different. If you ask what these stories of big hope built around trees want to say about God, you'll find that at the beginning and the end, this is a God whose work and transformational work is done in growing and nurturing and forming, forming a person from the dust of the earth, breathing in the breath of life, building a new heaven and earth and a new city, planting a tree of life that feeds the people around it and brings peace to the world. And I would tell you, if that's the God that we see at the beginning, nurturing and forming and growing, and that's the God we see at the end, nurturing and forming and growing, then life as people who live in between those trees, our life must be given to that same process of nurturing and forming and growing. That if we live a faith that is defined by the ideas in our head that we agree with, but we are not engaged with the act of nurturing and forming and growing, then we've missed something critical at the heart of God. So as we ask, where is our next step on the hope-filled journey? I can tell you that in any given month, I may be in a different sermon series. And believe it or not, these sermon series are not handed down to me on high from United Methodist headquarters. Um, I write them myself. And I write them based on what does the church need to hear in this season? What are people facing? What are people working through? And I'm going to try something on this in this next step in 2025. Um, we're going to have a focus, not just for the sermon series that starts the year, but we're going to have an intentional focus for the entire year of 2025. And that is formation. How are we being formed as followers of Jesus? What are the things in our life that are shaping us into something we are not right now? What are the things we are growing into? What are the things in our life we have let grow but maybe didn't need to grow and run wild in the first place. What are the things in our lives that needed to grow, but we haven't given it the light and the water and the food that it really needs to take root in our lives? Because whether you realize it or not, when you go out into the world to live and to work, to have relationships, to go to the grocery store, to do anything that you are doing, you are not just choosing how to do those things. The th ways that you do those things form you as a person. They shape you and teach you how to get things done and what to value and how to get what you want. 
Everything we do forms us in some way. And part of our call as followers of Jesus is we must intentionally choose day by day the things that are forming us. Because if we don't, someone else will choose for us. I think that is true church-wide, across our community. That there are plenty of churches that have put lots of time and effort into big flashy events or big community events where, yeah, a lot of people show up, but those people aren't formed in any, any kind of way. Now, I promise I'm not banishing fun for the year 2025. I'm just asking us to ask the questions of ourselves. How are we choosing to form ourselves and others? How are we choosing to form Parkway as a place where people can have their needs met and grow as followers of Jesus? And this is true not just on a community level. This is true in each of our lives. Each of us are being formed by something. And each of us have the capacity to be formed in a way that will not hit the mark of where we want to go. And I can tell you this not just as somebody um, who has figured all of this out. And I'm lecturing you from this side of the pulpit. I'm working on it every single day. I got back from a kind of pastor meeting slash retreat in Arkansas this last week. And the topic of the meeting was kind of resilience, uh, not getting burned out, on and on. And I, I, could, I would have told you showing up that I needed that topic. But I can tell you on the other side of it that I have let a lot of bad habits grow in the stress of trying to do everything well in ministry. Uh, I, like some of you, might suffer from the delusion that I don't really need anybody's help and I can do everything myself. Anybody else do that? Don't, you don't have to raise your hand, but you can if you want to. Yeah, I'll do it too. Uh, I am often also, I'm also often my own worst critic. I can pick apart anything that I do and ignore any praise. Um, I can say and think things about myself that I would never dream, never in a million years think or say to another human being. These are all ways that we have been formed as people, that we feel that our value is in how we can produce, that our value is in how we don't really need to ask for help, that we can best grow by tearing ourselves apart rather than encouraging ourselves on to do something different. I, I stand here and tell you not just to... Um, um, put all of what I've thought about myself in a retreat on top of all of you, but because I know I'm not the only one in this room who does those things. And I'm not the only one in the room who has been formed in a way where I have not tended to the things that most give me life. All of us are like that. And the reality of talking about formation is that no one can do those things for you. Ultimately, you must choose to engage in the things that will form you as a follower of Jesus because the world will not give them to you served up on a plate. And the other side is this. I, as your pastor, find deep joy and meaning in walking this spiritual journey with you. I am here for you on the good days and the hard days to encourage you, to help with guidance, to just listen to you and not say anything if you don't want me to. But as much as I take joy in helping guide your formation, I cannot do it for you. And it's not simply done in the ways that we show up in these seats on a Sunday morning. I would bet there's plenty of people here who have known people who show up to church nearly every single week and still don't get it. That show up and sit in their seat every single week and then still go yell at the waitress at lunch afterwards. You have to choose this intentional formation in your life, not simply as a self healthy kind of way of living an easier life, but because the God we are following is one at the beginning and the end that we see an image of one who nurtures and gathers together and intentionally forms and grows some new hope. And that is the work that we are going to engage in all through the year of 2025. That no matter what we face or what dream we dream or what, how we hope to serve our community, we ask, how are we forming ourselves? How are we forming others? How are we inviting people into a community that chooses how we are formed as followers of Jesus? And like I talked about with my kids, we all have different ways of growing. We all have different personalities. We all are in different places. We do not all wear the same size spiritual pants. 
We are all in different places and we have different ways of growing and taking the next step. But the, the core truth of formation that I'm putting you today is this. You have to know where that next step is going. You have to choose it. You have to choose the things you will nurture and flourish and grow and form in your life. We're going to land on this again in January as we start a new year and we talk about what does it mean to be formed. But as we get ready to step into the holidays, Advent, Christmas, which is, seems to be equal parts uh, beloved and dreaded for its busyness, I would ask you as you get ready to step into that, how are you being formed in the busyness of the season? Is it in being there and buying what you need to do and seeing and being seen? What would it mean to be formed by the story? That the God who plants these trees at the beginning and the end, the tree of life which provides food and peace for the world, that that same God who we see as one who nurtures and grows and forms and helps us flourish, is the one who comes to be born among us to live like us and to call us to live that life in a different way. Friends, the next step on our hope-filled journey is in choosing the ways that we will be formed as followers of Jesus, the one who lived among us and the one who walks beside us and the one who way before us and way after us has already done the work of nurturing and forming and shaping the hard cracked ground so that something new might grow. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Alleluia and Amen.